Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. And you guys know that this is my favorite part of the show. At least I, I say that, but it is. And then when I start having a conversation with with the guests, they, they open my insight and my mind and my spirit to a lot more information. But I love this part because it gives me an opportunity to thank my guests for coming and bringing some expensive uh, gifts with them, their time. Uh, Kevin, your time is very precious. We are all given 24 hours and it's very valuable. And so I want to thank you for coming and spending some of that precious stuff with us. The other is your journey. It housed who you were. It created this beautiful spirit that is sitting before us and is about to engage in a conversation to enlighten us, to make us better human spirits while we occupy this beautiful place called Earth. Kevin, thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Hey, Ken, I appreciate, appreciate you, and I, 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 I've enjoyed listening to you know, a prior broadcast of yours. I've enjoyed hearing that introduction, uh, and have you, as you listen, as, as, as I listen, I know it's a restatement, but such an important thing, and I, I uh, that whole concept that you bring out each time about the importance of time, and time is a gift, and um it, it's finite, and I, I yeah. but I welcome the opportunity, and, and I'm welcoming the opportunity to have this discussion with you and to share this with your listeners, and that it, it really enriches that element of time uh, that we have, and yes. it makes it possible for us to share that time with others. I do appreciate it because I do understand how expensive it is. And that is why I always want to make sure that uh, people know and learn from it and learn to value their 24 hours because it's given to the mm. rich and the poor. What we do with it is based on our perception and how we process our information. But Kevin, thank you so much for coming. We like to go back into the first state, I call it, the first state by which we get a chance to reside for several years. And um, mom and dad began to program us based from their trauma. I, I believe that every one of us on this planet is traumatized. I believe a perfect example of that is the fact that when we are, when we enter into this natural world, it is through trauma. And I believe that is most of us through the mm. spiritual world is the same. And so um, talk to us about your family unit. What was it like? Because again, it is the place by which one of the institution is about to program us. Uh, introduce us to your family, and how was that? Well, thanks for that question. And I, I just jotted a note here that you know what you just said—that we enter the world through trauma. And um, I guess that's and, and that's probably we all share that, no matter who we are in the world. Um, yes, uh, with the birth pro with the birth process. And uh, I think one thing to tell about to talk about my family is to say that um, it's likely my my dad and my uncle, uh, along with their wives, operated a fun operated a funeral home, and our families lived in the apartments above the funeral home. And I, I uh, it's likely, although I have no no way to prove it, it's likely that I was conceived, you know, in the midst of. Uh, you know the, the grief that was happening in the funeral home below so as as yeah. people were making their exit i personally was making my having my conception and then later my birth right yeah. in the midst of a of a funeral home so that's a little um so my both my dad and my uncle and my dad my uncle in 1930 and my dad joined him about eight or nine years later um owned and operated a funeral home and that's the house in which I was raised. And that's the house, that's the growing up experience that influenced me and the the environment in which I lived. And um, I like to term it uh, uh, two floors above grief because we had two apartments, yeah. two stories above the funeral home. But um, the, uh, the family life, the family life we had with my two brothers and my three cousins, Two sets of parents, my parents and my aunt and uncle, um, was pretty was pleasant. Was I? I'd like to, as I read other people's memoirs, stories, whether it's the, the real thing or fiction. I, I, the older I get, the more I appreciate 
the way in the environment in which I was raised and the and the positives that, that can come from that. And it's really given me a foundation to go through the rest of life. And uh, I often, when I stumble or fall or fail, um, yeah, I feel like I'm grounded into those those uh, those years of experiences. Hold on, Can you, we're having a, an alarm in our house in our building. <laughs> uh, no problem. <laughs> It's going to go on the background. I'm not sure how I can block yeah. it out. Sometimes. Oh, we will try okay. and see what we can do on our end. But yeah, that's okay. a powerful place to be, um, uh, Kevin, to have both the dichotomy of life, meaning a great family energetically learning a lot. And as you said, below on the second floor, there is so much grief that is constantly there um, that is day in, day out. Maybe you, want, you have some break in between there, but grief lives there, if you will. Um, how did this young man um, get a chance? Because I'm sure you're there to witness some of that grief at a young age. What did it do to you with those both having both the dichotomy of your family unit strong and seeing that grief around in others as they are uh, dealing with the separation from a loved one. Okay, yeah, great question. I um, and I part what I say to other people is that I've really known and I've never really known any different. You know, <laughs> that that was just yeah. the way life was. So even from an early age. It wasn't unusual for me to be in the my dad's shadow as he was working in the funeral home, or uh, or he might be, I might be playing with toys on the on the uh, funeral home floor while he was setting up chairs or preparing a body in a coffin. You know, it just mm -hmm. it, it didn't I didn't know any different. So sometimes when people ask me, um, but do you, do you view do you, do I view or feel grief any differently just because I had those experiences? Now that I've yeah. experienced quite a bit of grief in my own life uh, and having talked to people and read other books, I really don't think I experience grief any differently. I, maybe more, I experienced it as a way just to say it's part of life. This is what happens yeah. uh, to, watch, to watch families experience it. Um, as I got older and got more mm -hmm. involved in helping in the funeral home as a teenager and college student, then was amidst the people that were experiencing the grief, I found all kinds of different approaches about how people do it. You know, whether it's yeah. very calm and very peaceful and very communicative to um, you know, loud, <laughs> loud reactions and, yeah. and ways to express himself in different ways. So what I think I learned living in that environment was just all the different approaches and people mm -hmm. approach, people approach their losses, I think in same in varied ways, just the same way we approach our joys and our, our yeah. happinesses. And, and I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, that's what I gained from the experience, I think of living. And I know my, I know my growing up was unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, there's only um, at currently there's only about 2,500 funeral directors in the United States, so that's still a minority wow. of still a minority of of people that pursue this profession. And even in my yeah. own in my own high school grade school settings, I was the only kid who lived in a funeral home. So um, yeah, yeah. that that was that made me unusual, but. Um, uh, Interesting, I guess. I'm looking for the right, looking for a word there. So I still had yeah. regular friendships. I still had uh, associations. I rode my bike. I had a paper route. I, you know, mm -hmm. went to the school dances. I did school activities. All that was the same. It was no different than what my friends were experiencing. So that that was how that was how I experienced life. How, how did your friends? Uh, um, reacted to that because a lot of 
outsiders, if you will, Kevin, there's a degree of fearfulness um, as much as there's a degree of um, yeah, to, to inquire and inquisitiveness, there's also a fearfulness factor. How did you deal with your friends um, with that subject of death and grief? As, and you're familiar with it, but they are not, but curious, if you will. Sure. Um, well, I guess one, one case comes to mind, um, in many cases, but in terms of when I tie it together with my friends, we were, mm -hmm. you know, frequent visitors to my house. I had sleepovers like other kids do. And some kids, yeah. I would show them uh, the funeral home or, uh, but I knew where to go and where not to go based on my dad and uncle's directions, um, what to show and what not to show. Um, yeah. But there was um, there was an incident when I was 14. I had a class of 24 kids in my eighth grade class. But the summer after eighth grade, um, one of our classmates died suddenly. And so mm -hmm. um, his name was Francis. And so you know, my dad let me know what was happening and then gave me some counsel as to um, don't tell your friends yet. Let me figure out what's going on here. He was, he was just, he had just gotten off the phone and he, he just confided in me right away what had happened. And then he said, yeah. but just don't share this with your friends until I learn more. But so then when the wake came uh, a couple days later, most of my friends and their families came to the funeral home part of the, our house and everybody, um, each each of my adolescent friends handled it in different ways. Some people wanted to be right there in the funeral home and hang out. Mm -hmm. Others, and especially those that were familiar with my house, would go out to the front porch yeah. and, and we'd hang out there. And just and then the, the parents operated in a different way. So that was one one way that I really um, blended my own experiences with my friends. Um, other yeah. times, you know, without a without an incident like a funeral or a wake of a friend going on, my friends would come mm -hmm. over and we watch TV, play games, play basketball, do the stuff other families do. And my parents and my aunt and uncle were very receptive to having our friends there at the house. They didn't want us not to have friends come over. And it was never even the yeah. perception that I had. Our back door was like any other friend's back door. You, you came in and, and, and came up this, what I would call coming up the stairs and have snacks in the kitchen or uh, you know whatever it is we were doing. Uh, some friends, yes. uh, I had another friend named George who I did probably show more than I should have one time. He came to stay overnight. And a few days later, I went to his house and his mother said to me, what did you do to George? And I said, "What do you mean?" He woke up in the middle. Of, he woke up in the middle of the night with the sheets over his head, and he said, "Kevin, Kevin, get me out of here!" And she said, "Where'd you take him?" And I said, "Well, I know. I showed him the casket room. I, I maybe took a peek in the embalming room. I don't know." <laughs> but anyway, George, George, you know that's what George assimilated into his own inner thoughts. Uh, I. You know, yeah. I had no intention of terrorizing him. To me, it was just, hey, let me <laughs> let me walk you around my house. Yeah, we've we've got a family room and a living room and a bedroom and a kitchen, but hey, we also have a casket room. How about you go look at the casket room? <laughs> so maybe um, in, in George's in, in George's um, eyes and his his mental state, he took it a much way different than I would. Uh, I think we were probably ten yeah. or eleven at the time. But you know, he probably took it in a whole different way, a whole different way. So that, I'm that sure couple, he had to do some couple stories, some therapy on that. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> had I have. I, you know, I've been. Uh, I found out. Unfortunately, <laughs> I was trying to get a hold. I found out unfortunately that he's passed. But I, I would have. Um, yeah. yeah, I would like to talk to him about what his view is 60 years later. You know? Yeah. What do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, I, won't, I won't have so, the opportunity to get that those ideas. Yeah, so it's, it seems like a pretty normal childhood, if you will. And as you're moving through your high school and heading into college, uh, Kevin, when you're heading in that direction, where did you go and why did you pick the field, uh, the field of study? Did, 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 you, did you continue the family business or did you want to move on to something else? 
Okay. Yeah, great question. I did not choose to continue in the family business. Um, mm -hmm. My uh, parents and my uncle my aunt, were never ones to say, hey, we've established this. You kids have to take it over. They, they never did that. They just, um, they just kept encouraging us to to open ourselves up to whatever we wanted to do. So yes, we helped and yeah. we knew uh, we knew what the business was about. We, uh, I never really got into the science part of it or the embalming part of it. I never really knew. I still don't know what what that's about. But um, they never pressured us into saying, hey, we worked too hard to build this business up. They let us all do our own thing. For me, um, I had an affinity for um, student government and political studies. I was always fascinated with political campaigns. I knocked on doors for John F. Kennedy and when I was 10 years old in, in wow. 1960. So I always had that affinity for politics. So my first, when I went to college at Loyola, Chicago, um, I was a political science major and kept mm -hmm. that major through all four years, but also had been dabbling in some education classes. And so when it came I graduated in 72. So when it came to decide what am I going to do with this next part of my life, I went into banking for a year in San Francisco and thought, nah, that's not it. But I was still yeah. had this a, a draw to education. And that's when I got uh, was accepted in the education program at, Ber at UC Berkeley to uh, get my education. At that time, in the state of California, there were no undergraduate degrees in, in education. Everybody had to have mm. a bachelor's in whatever they chose, and then they called it a credential year. I'm not sure how they do it now. But so everybody that was in this fifth year, they called it the, the other thing they said, they called it fifth year, was had come from other disciplines. So I wasn't alone mm -hmm. um, in that sense. Uh, everybody, uh, the other 30 people in my group, all had come from other backgrounds, and we went right into uh, intern teaching together in in the in the bay area there around, around berkeley so and i i knew i when i got into it i i this is where i this is where i was meant to be so and spent the next well i'm still working sometimes so uh yeah. that was had my first employed teaching job in 1974 but i that's what i pursued i got my master's i got my doctorate it became a principal taught college classes have done uh, consulting work, have done uh, writing curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. I, le I retired in 2020 from a job here in Fort Lauderdale where I was doing a lot of advocacy work for LGBT students and at the same time um, writing and um, implementing curriculum for sexual health for kids. So when I, I kid sometimes, um, when I left my principal job, retiring in 19, I was an elementary school principal in 2007 in the state of Illinois. And when I left there, I had no idea that five or six later, five or six years later, I'd be giving condom demonstrations to high school students. So, you know, I went mm -hmm. from you know, reading books to kindergartners to um, writing curriculum and then showing uh, high school students how to use a condom. I mean, so that that was something I never dreamed of, something I never conceived of. But I've enjoyed so many parts of my career and the variety that the education field has has presented to me. I, I really, I really like that part. So, yeah, that's a good place to be because you you mm -hmm. start practicing your art of servanthood, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, to serve is a beautiful thing, and to see the um the imprint of your um your journey your daily inter interaction if you will with um people and how they assimilate your information and and move through in their life so talk to us a little about the educational field as far as some of the things that you learn there some of the things that you observe when you were interacting with different types of people because uh, you got a great foundation as a young boy to see the different types of grief, the tip, different types of um, uh, uh, expression of grief. When you're in your school as a teacher, um, 
what were some of those um, expressions of learning that you began to see and observe from all the different types of personality that were presenting before you for so many years? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, <laughs> and I think you 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 used the word servitude a couple you know a few sentences ago, and I think that's another yeah. way that I connect my upbringing with my career, because certainly in the funeral home business, um, that is a, that's an act of servitude. <laughs> It's like a call. Yeah. So to, to witness that and even, you know, I say witness and observe, I, I, I wouldn't, I didn't even treat it, treat it as witnessing or observing. I just lived it every day as I watched, as I watched uh, the adults in my life um, do, do the business. But servitude certainly transfers into the education field. And uh, just as, yeah. as I'm reflecting more and more these, these years, um, I realized that there really, there was a connection that I maybe didn't even identify when I was in the act of being a teacher or a principal, it was servitude. It was servitude to the students. It was servitude to principal, yeah. uh, other teachers. One of the things I think in tying back with what your comment and your question was, I think, and having viewed, learned to view grief, um, in a variety of ways, and knowing that no one person, no one family ever did it the same, I think that equipped yeah. me when I got into education to realize that no learner learns anything in the same way. And even though there's different periods in education or uh, tenets of education that homogenizes it and says that, you know, we have to... Uh, Everybody has to learn it at the same time, and we're going to put kids in a desk, and they're going to learn mm -hmm. it. And, and if they don't get it, well, then we're just going to move on. Um, I never adapted that as my philosophy in education, uh, whether I was yeah. when I was learning. Well, I, I was going to say when I was learning to teach, there never was a time when I wasn't learning to teach <laughs> because yeah. every student, every student had their own gifts that they were presenting to me. So I had to listen, and and I don't mean had to in a task fashion. I meant that was part of the pleasure of the, of the occupation was to listen and to get in tune with how they're learning. But I also found that that was during my teaching career. But when I became a principal and got really more and more and more acquainted with adult learning and, and not only working with my staff but also teaching college classes, that that same principal mm -hmm. that I am employed in the funeral home, the, the same principle I employed in the uh, classrooms that I was teaching. Each of us approaches things in just a variety of ways. And there's a range. And in my management style, as a principal, I had I learned quickly <laughs> um, over the and during the 21 years I was a principal that yeah. to, to honor each person's own individual teaching style. I have to say that sometimes I did a better job at that than others, uh, depending on what was in the atmosphere, what a district was telling me to do, or what a current philosophy was conveying and, and trying to get teachers to adapt or to buy in or to go along. Um, I guess that's part that would be true of any profession. So, but I just kept this in my head. Um, we all have our own way of doing things. We all have our own way of of um, approaching our field. Yeah, I guess another tie and I'm thinking of right off the top of my gray head here is that um, I came out when I was 55. We each have our own way yeah. of coming out. Um, yeah. And we each have our, so whether we're experiencing grief or whether I'm experiencing the many years I did spent in the classroom or the 21 years I did as a principal or all the other stuff I did with students in my college classes, um, we all evolve at different rates. And that whole kind, I like that concept of the, um, you know, the butterfly, the uh, cocoon and letting the butterfly yeah. come out at their own rate. And when we, in our effort to help, we maybe peel back a little bit of the cocoon, we're hurting the process and we have to let it yeah, happen. Yeah. And now, boy, Ken, I'm just going back to what you said at the very, very beginning. 
about how um, the trauma, we, we all enter this world through trauma and we all experience yeah. the, the world through either post-traumatic or we experience the world at rates that we decide we're going to put on ourselves or at mm -hmm. rates that other people are putting on us. So you're helping me. Wow. You're helping me just see <laughs> uh, with your questions and your prompts just the connections of life and the inter interplay, the interplay of life that I that I thought at 73, I, I, had, I had figured that out, but there's always more to figure out, always more to figure out. So I appreciate your, yeah, they, they, your, your, dig, your <laughs> I appreciate your digging in the way you are. <laughs> um, I tell people this because I, I interview people and, and I know a lot of folks um, outside of what I do um, when I talk to them and their concern about their life and I tell them they're like oh I'm only I'm, I'm only this I'm only that I, I only did this I didn't do that and I and I try to convey everything that you did is a part of the plan so don't have you don't have to have that conversation I only did this oh I can only do that no mm -hmm. all of what you did everything is a part of the plan and all of it will be used just hang in there and it, it will all make sense at some point but here you are the folks kevin had it um i mean uh those that were around you as students and teachers and faculty and all of those things um were very privileged to have you that you had that understanding of individualism uh and the growth and the expression of the in individual. How did that belief of yours right there, um, how did you manage that with the system that says everyone has to move at the same time, everyone has, and you have the knowledge knowing that's not the case. I'm sure that sometimes that gave you some sense of frustra frustration, but how did you deal with it? Uh, because um, I have lots of families that were in teachers and came out of that system. And when they had to buck the system, if you will, they re um, had some resistance within the system. How was it in yours when you were navigating with that insight that everyone is moving at a different rate? Yeah. Ooh. That... Um... I don't know where do I start. I'll start. I'll start. I'll pick a beginning and I'll start. But I, I'm just thinking that uh, education, uh, in the ideal set, when I was taking my classes in undergrad and doing some work in yeah. Chicago public schools as a volunteer and doing what I thought was helping, and it probably was. But it's so, and still, education still continues to be very institutionalized and um yeah. and theories and when i was a young teacher even as a young principal people would come to me ah we just ride this one out well they, we'll just ride this theory out it'll <laughs> go away and i'll just keep doing what i'm doing and that was true for some people i guess part of what i did uh i was my master's degree in my education classes at berkeley were mostly founded on the theories of uh, Piaget and that whole development mm -hmm. and the developmental learning yeah. processes. And, and that's that's where uh, when I got into learning more about what I want to be as a teacher, that is it was theorists like Piaget that 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 helped found gave me the foundation for still building on that whole idea that we're all individual learners. And so I yeah. guess even in uh, when I was first teaching i've determined I, I ended up working with colleagues who and was fortunate to be in a school which was pretty much based on piagetian theories and um nice when my first jobs were all in schools that were called that we called them multi-age learning schools because each of us as teachers we didn't i was so used to my own education, being in first grade, second grade, third grade, 12th grade, 13th, you know, everything was great, 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 great. But when I got my first mm -hmm. teaching job, I had a classroom of kindergarten, first, second, and third grade kids, 32 of them all in the same classroom. 
So those mm-hmm. things we talked about earlier, I I was put in an environment where I had they had taken away the whole idea. Well, what do you do in second grade? I didn't have it anymore. Mm-hmm. I saw immediately as a young teacher that hey, this kindergartner can read, but this third grader is still struggling, and they're I can put them in a group together because they're at the same level in this particular topic we're talking about. So I really yeah. saw readily. Now, when I, um, so in that school, that was the environment I had. Uh, and then when I moved, when I moved uh, from California, that was uh, northern uh, in a town called Vallejo, California. When I made the move to come back to the homeland of the Midwest, at that time, in, in uh, what are we talking about, 1978, um, those, those theories weren't there. <laughs> I, I was yeah. getting uh, yeah. interviewed for jobs where I was expected to, um, uh, you know, these, this is, we expect these, we expect these uh, t- tests to stay in rows. We want you at the front of the classroom. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. This was more of a parochial setting that I'd interviewed for, but it was a real shock for me that I thought, wait a minute, I'm used to having kids on the floor. <laughs> we have tables and chairs. We move things around. We meet in a circle every morning. We have a class meeting and I mean, what it told me for that first, that job I interviewed for and was accepted. And I said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to say no to this job. I'm going to keep looking. Yeah. Um, but I just tried in the, with the, I did get some resistance over the, over the years. And I had some uh, failures and some successes. We were able to put into our school district um, in, in the Northwest suburbs of uh, Illinois, Cary school district. There was a group of us that got together and wanted to, to do this type of developmental setting for our, our learners. Um, and mm-hmm. we had them, we worked, found teachers to work with and we provided training and we, uh, it was all volunteer basis. Uh, if you want to teach a, uh, in a setting that's not um, geared to grades, let's work together to do that. Then we would go to the parents and say, here's what we have in mind. So we never forced anybody into these, any, these situations. And it was really, it really thrived for a while and it was exciting. Wow. It really was exciting yeah, to yeah. see that come to life and to, and to see the potential. And, but I, I got some resistance one time more than once, but one time that comes to <laughs> mind was I wanted to, as the principal, I wanted to rearrange our school building. The building had been arranged like most elementary schools. The first graders are in this hall. The second graders are in this hall. And, you know, that it's all segmented, segmented. And um, mm-hmm. and I said, no, let's change it around. But by that time, we had kids that uh, we had teachers that were sort of buying into the philosophy. But also we had some teachers yeah. that were, were doing multi-age and they might have first and second graders in the same room. So I thought... Uh, Let's let's change the let's change the dynamics of the building by not having halls designated by by um, grades, but mix it up. So have a right. first grade classroom mm-hmm. next to a sixth grade classroom. Have a fourth grade classroom that shared a door with the with a first grade classroom. Have the kindergartners mixed up, and we got it all laid out and I got most of the buy in. But then pushback started in the community and. Wow, I had never had that much resistance wow. to one of my ideas before. But it was, I look back now, it was good. It was good. Um, uh, I think we proceeded with that kind of format in our building uh, probably for the next seven or eight years before I retired. But it was just to, wow. and to get that appreciation to see kids interact with each other without that barrier of a grade, re- it was removed. So kids were more inclined to, play with somebody that wasn't their uh, grade level. Mm-hmm. And the way I was able to present that and try when I got put in positions of why are you doing this? I would just put it back to the families and say, well, tell me what happens in your neighborhood. Tell me what happens in your house. Do you, um, yeah. do kids come over to your house only because they're in the same grade uh, or do, do they, um, do they just, do they play together? apart from their age. And when parents started to, when I started to make that analogy, they said, you know, that's the way it is in the neighborhood. We, we don't play, yeah. uh, when the kids are playing tag, they're not saying, oh, I can't play with you. You're not in my grade. They're playing all, yeah, yeah. And, and, when, and when we go to family reunions, the parents would say, no, we don't do that. And so 
I uh, would just try to, when I would get that kind of resistance, I, I guess that goes back to what I said earlier, the listening capability kicked in. Okay. What are these families yeah. telling me? How, what can mm -hmm. we, how can we change the dialogue to help them not maybe completely buy into what I'm proposing, but help them to understand that it is an unusual, even at that time they were getting, yeah. um, some of the parents were getting upset that I would have, even though we, we had boy bathrooms and girl bathrooms, which is a whole nother issue, but, yeah. but we, uh, <laughs> but then it was, how can my, how can my first grader go to the bathroom with a fifth grader? And I would say, and to me, I'm thinking, okay. And then I would say, well, what do you do at home? Wow. And, um, oh, gee, you're right. Um, so I said, I, I really think, and I tried to point out to people that the things we're making problems out of perhaps aren't problems. And, yeah. but I was grateful for those challenges because going back to Berkeley and the Piagetian way of doing things and switching into multi-age groupings and, and helping kids and teachers and parents understand that, hey, in the real world, when we get out of high school, we're not, and get our first job, our, our question isn't going to be, um, yeah, did you go to the same, are, are we in the same grade and we're working on this project? How, how, how can we be on this project together? No, when we're going to, in the work environment, yeah. we're going to be working with people that are two years, three years, four years, 20 years, 30 years yeah. younger or older than us. And to me, yeah. um, to, to get that into the thinking of an elementary environment was very important to me at the time. That's a fascinating story, Kevin, it, that the resistance came from uh, the family more so than anything else. And um, I guess because we are all programmed and that's how they went to school. And of course, you know, that's how it should be. And that's mm -hmm. how it's always mm -hmm. been. Those are the type of stuff you hear. And when you are leading someone in a new direction, it's always a little hesitant in their acceptance of that new beginnings if you will so here you are you were experiencing so much uh kevin you you talked about uh the effect that you're having on so many families kids all of those things that um you are uh dealing with now what was happening in your personal life you've doing a lot on the outside you're dealing with people all of that stuff is great but what's happening to Kevin in the middle of all of this accolades and uh, accomplishment. What was he doing in the midst of this? Mm. <laughs> that's, a, um, <laughs> that's a great question. And, and I'm happy to, to, to get into that a little bit. Um, so the inside me, the, the, the succeeding in um, education though, uh, and getting to different degrees and all that. But in in my gut, um, even from an early age, I I, I knew, uh, yes, I was different because I lived in a funeral home. I was different because yeah. I maybe wasn't as athletic as some of my other friends were. Um, but I knew I was different because I didn't have, I didn't have a name to call it at the time in the fifties, but I was gay. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. But I, in, in growing up, uh, again, I didn't even have a name for it at the time. Uh, but uh, at least I didn't have a name for it. But the, uh, so that was what's going on inside a little bit. And how do I deal that with that societally? Well, I just pretty much buried it. And the, the concept of being in the closet um, was, is, was certainly part of what was going on. But I had... I I wanted to be, I felt at the time when I was a teenager, college kid, that if I ever did anything um, to tell people about that would just separate myself from my family, separate myself from my friends, uh, things that I know now probably wouldn't have been true. But um, mm -hmm. so I really just, I went on and I just adapted into a life with friends, you know, female, male. Unidentified, you know, unidentified uh, friends, and we use those terms now, but we didn't have that term in the uh, yeah. non-binary. We didn't have that term in the 70s, 80s, 90s. 
but um, I just, I just always was, it was easy for me to develop circles of friends and circles of professional colleagues and, and be in relationships. So what was going on uh, personally was I got married to a very good college friend and we're still friends, um, got married and uh, she was one of the first ones that I was able to start to convey that um, I think I have an attraction for men too. <laughs> This is, it was in the mm -hmm. 20 and being in a 20 something that's sort of complicated in 1970s. So anyway, but she was understanding. We decided um, we went to counseling. We decided to um, to end our marriage. And then I uh, I was now teaching in the Midwest and met a woman who became my wife. We had two children and I had this idea of me being gay, gay just I just removed it from who I was because I got busy being yeah. a dad. I loved being a father. And I, in my mind still, I was having to think I had to separate those two. I am so appreciative mm -hmm. of, of the current generation of, of uh, gay and lesbian couples who are able to do this, do their family thing and, and not divorce themselves from their identity. I, I yeah. used a, a more 1970s, 80s approach and just uh, willingly um, put myself in, in the parent role, the husband role, enjoyed it, loved it, did all the community stuff, um, you know, raised my kids through uh, and with my wife uh, through all the school years. And then it was um, in the early um, 2000s, then I started this this thing that uh, uh, when I get into conferences with other uh, LGBT groups or gay men, they have similar feelings. It's, it's sort of in the pit of your stomach and you, and you, where do you put it? And where, where does, how does that move yeah, around your yeah. body and what do you do with it? And so it came, um, when my son was about 16, 17 in the early two thousands, he was starting to, uh, in his own way, come out. And I thought, and it hadn't been through any discussions I had with him or anything like that, just yeah. on his own. And I guess that uh, it goes back to that cocoon thing we talked about. People evolve on their own race. Yeah. And when I started to experience him doing that and trying to uh, deal with it and the, the, the roots he took, I thought, Kev, you've, you've kept this buried too long. <laughs> you've, you can't. I have to proceed with who I am authentically. And I was going to counseling at the time. She was a great help. And just um, so as I was doing the parent role of, of uh, the yin and the yang, a lot of tension there, I was ha yeah. I was coming to the decisions myself that I, I needed to come out, which over a process of time resulted in the, the ending of that marriage and um about over about uh, it's almost 20 years ago but um so that was part of what was going on with me personally and still i was when i decided to come out to myself and to my mom mm -hmm. who was still alive at the time i decided i still had two years left of my uh, contract as a principal and um my mom was a great counsel at this time she said, yeah. um, well, you know, it's probably not a good idea for you to, and, and I, sometimes in my life, I, I am a soapbox person. I'll get up and I'll declare what I'm about and who I am. I'm a presenter. I'm a presenter by nature. Uh, and, yeah. she, and we talk and we said, no, this is not 2005, 2000, probably not a good environment. Uh, she said, you know what? One thing people in our communities are just, they're going to be grappling this with the idea of you getting a divorce as we do with our friends yeah. and family. And that's a whole nother change in the dynamic. She said, they're going to be grappling with that. Let's not, um, let's not put the, uh, let's not put that gay card out there right now. So she was mm -hmm. a great counselor at that time. And, um, and until the, the divorce became official, um, when the divorce became official, I had one year left on my contract as a principal and still was doing fine being a principal. But I really didn't mm. start talking to people about it um, more openly until I, I um, 
and, and then and I, during that time, I, I had met the man who I'm married to now. So, and will be, um, I don't, so I, I, uh, but I didn't start telling other people publicly. Now I'm much more authentic, much more free of that. And it's just a, a whole different place to be at for me. And it's a welcome space. And I don't begrudge um, or think think back and think, gee, if I'd done this differently, what's the point to go back and think about that? Yeah, There's yeah. A, I'm not sure if you I'm not sure if you're familiar with a um, term called beshert. It's a Yiddish term, mm -hmm. b a s h e r t, and it's it's meant mm -hmm. to be. And I was introduced to that term um, through my when I first started seeing my my with Leon, my husband. And it's that that term has helped me to grapple with things happen for a reason. Things things evolve because they're supposed to evolve in that way. Um, sometimes I, I think, gee, that. sometimes I think if I had come out when I first had these inklings uh, in the 1970s, uh, before I got married, if I had come out and done that route, there's a good chance you and I wouldn't you and I wouldn't be here having this conversation. When I look at the people my age, um, when I see their names on the AIDS quilt and those kind of places or read their stories, most of yeah. those men were born in the 40s and 50s and are no longer with us. So, um, yeah. for, so I, so sometimes I think I'm here for a reason and, and the people I met and the situations I, I evolved into I'm, I'm, I've got, I made it this far because I'm meant to be here. So back I to your, so. your question, I... what was going on personally while I was doing this professional stuff? This was, this was the, what was going on in my head and my mind and my body. Um, and through the help of wonderful friends or wonderful counselors, uh, this courage, I think on my part to do the things I did and to say, this is the time. And to be able to accept and encounter and with um, things that might be presented to me with the coming out process, it, it's, yeah. it's evolved this way because it's meant to be. It's meant to be. It had to be so. that way, uh, Kevin. I don't think, I think I try, one of the things I'm learning in my life as I get older, everything is meant to be in its own space and in its own time. I believe because there was a some form of agreement, I believe, in our knowing, in our growing. And that an agreement is, I, it will come to me when it comes to me, <laughs> if you know. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and when you get into that space, I believe, that's when you don't take things personally. And one of the lessons that I'm learning Kevin in life at um, 62 is that not to allow anything, not to take anything from anyone personally at all, because it isn't meant to take personally. If I do take it personally, that's when I get hurt. It is meant mm -hmm. to, as uh, I am meant to live this life as much as an observer, as one, as a participant. And so when people are in my space and they're, um there's an exchange that's my time to become an observer it is not the time to become one that will take things uh, personally and when i do that i have entered into a space of judgment of some sort that is why i took it personally because there's something that happened where i'm judging something and it was able to pull me out of my space and if i am judging something then there is something I need to deal with. And mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. how I'm living my life. And I've learned to uh, let things go, as you said. So here you are. One of the most powerful stories I ever saw in my life. Uh, my family and I, we used to do a lot of um, watching a TV because we came from a different culture. And I remember in high school when I walked in high school and and they had a race riot happening in high school, and I'm standing there with my dad. Uh, I went home to my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, why are they fighting like this? And he 
told me to go read some books and that's how I started reading about <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the Americans and the African Americans and the, the struggles and so forth. And one of the things that my family mm -hmm. used to do, uh, Kevin, was we used to watch at um, uh, these different things on, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was on TV and I remember watching the Naked Civil Servant, this program called the Naked, Naked Civil Servant, dealing with a young a man that was gay in the, I think it was in the 40s and 50s, and the struggle and the brutality and the beauty of that show. I, I encourage anyone to, to look at it. it. It opened your humanity because we are all humans. And, and I grew up in a church where everybody's going to hell. But I, I remember um, when I turned my back from quote unquote religion, um, I love is the key. And um, I, you have to, and I keep telling people, the commandment, if you're claiming to be a Christian and so forth, is to love everyone. Even if you're an enemy, you love your enemy. It is your responsibility. So when I see the madness happening out there, Kevin, it kind of pinpoints people's hypocrisy as to who they are when they say, I am a Christian and I'm religious and, or whatever they call and I tell them you're a hypocrite because um, you're the leader of that religion said love everyone. And so if you're coming to me because I've encouraged, I've had some stuff because of my, simply because of the house that I'm in. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, you're still arguing about my house. This is not who I am. It's just the vessel by which it occupies me to keep me legal on this planet. I just happen to be in one that is a little darker than yours. That's the beauty of a, mm -hmm. any, any life, you know. Uh, we ought to be accepting mm -hmm. of each, everyone. And, and um, as you are um, coming out, as you say, Kevin, and you are now beginning to engage with people to, because that's a tremendous pain to carry with you, that dichotomy for so long. As you're beginning to release yourself, to others, how did you begin to feel? Because for a long time, you weren't able to um, have that conversation. When you were releasing that information to others, your selected people that you were um, in your space, how did you feel? What was changing in you when you were having that conversation? Hmm. Well, I think. Um... And I, I wrote about this once in a um, a book I was asked to be a part of called uh, Journey Out. Uh, Journey Out is a collection of stories of of, of uh, people in marriages who decide to leave their traditional marriage and and embrace you know, their uh, whether they're gay or lesbian. But anyway, and one of the things I wrote about on that and, and they call them chronicles. So my mine was Kevin's chronicle. And I, one of the things I wrote about was that in, when we, we get caught up in this word coming out and um, the idea of coming out is uh, we experience coming out not only with sexual orientation, we come out when we choose a career, we come out when yep. we pick a, a partner, our next, the partners of our relationships, we come out when we get a driver's license. <laughs> We come out um, yeah. when we decide to pursue a, a certain academic thing. We we come out daily. We come out when we try a different kind of coffee. You know, I mean that's minimizing it a little bit, of course. But there's we make we put so much um, in terms of sexual orientation. We put so much on this concept of coming out when it's something that is a natural process. Um, so back to what you, you were asking, I think when I first, in 2007, when I first started to tell people, more and more people, who I was and what I was about and 
and how I was working to embrace all my life and now be a uh, so really, I made a decision that I wasn't, I was going to show pictures of myself with, uh, I met Leon in, in 2005 and um, we started, you know, uh, I moved down to live with him in 2007. But when we were ma making social media postings or when I was going to do a social engagement or anything with old friends, I was going to involve both of us. And I've done that ever since there's no re this is who i am it's 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 yeah. part of my life uh, he's very much a part of my life an important part a part that is is going to be there till the end so uh, and when yeah. i get involved in in my jobs that i've had in broward schools it's it's been advocacy for lgbt youth and telling my story and writing about my story and putting curriculum together and posting what i'm doing on social media so I've, uh, it's been very freeing in the last 15, almost 20 years. Yeah. That I haven't had to keep How that secret How did it change anymore. your relationship? How did it change your relationship mm -hmm. with your son? Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's a whole, it initially didn't change the relationship with them, uh, with either one of them at all. Well, especially the, yeah, uh, I shouldn't say especially. Well, I mean, the one that was coming out himself. I think, um, and although we don't really talk about the, that we're both gay, we don't talk about that. It's just who we are. We, we're just, we're yeah. a father and son partnership. Uh, the other son, um, the older one for, for reasons, for a whole other set of reasons, is not part of my life anymore. He's decided to estrange himself yeah. from me. But, it had, but my sense is it doesn't have anything to do with me being gay. It's a, it's a whole nother. Yeah. And I guess part of what you talked about earlier, when we come to these um, things about judgment, uh, you can, people can say, well, put yourself in their shoes or I've only got one pair of shoes <laughs> and they're my shoes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me to make yeah. a judgment about somebody else's. So I think what I, what has changed back to your a little bit, your, what it's changed in me is I'm not hiding anymore. And I guess, um, nice. and, and, and part of what in my prior relationships with, uh, I wives, girlfriends, even I, I had, I had that, um, that gay identity so buried that I never really, um, what am I going to say? What am I saying? I'm sometimes I, I, I have, I've wanted to apologize to them because mm. I, I I hid that part. And wh what was I, what, what part of me says, <laughs> the beshared of it, I guess, the part of me says, well, what was I going to do in, in a, in a marital, marital relationship in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, but sort of keep that, that part of me yeah. inside in the lower part of my gut. And, um, so now I, I want to, I feel so much freer now that even when I talk yeah. to, to my um, ex-wives or former girlfriends or other people that I had relationships with, that I don't have to hide that part of me anymore. That it's, I, I, yeah. I'm feeling much more whole, much more, um, um, I guess whole is the best word. Just this is who I am. This is who I've always been. I just didn't have the... Um, the time, the timing, or the outlets, or the perspective in that part of history, that other the, the, for me to do that. Now, other people my age, at age uh, seventy-three, who are who have been out most of their lives, they treated it differently. Um, but I, I guess in my own, I, I we're looking at my own perspective. I don't want to. I don't deal with making excuses, or this is why I decided that it, it's in the past. I'm grateful that I've lived this long, that I'm able to come to this wholeness and have this part of me that I can express so freely and be able to, to, um, uh, I'm so grateful at the times that I was able to sit in front of a group of high school students that would ask me about my journey and they'd say, well, why didn't you come yeah. out when you're in high school? Well, then I tell them, well, for me, the mid sixties was a whole lot different time 
than what we're living now. And a lot of people in my position didn't have that opportunity to do what the what kids do now. I don't think it makes it any easier, probably for kids of our day and age to, to come out and to grapple with this part of their identity. Mm-hmm. But I also know that when I'm, I've lived long enough to be able to tell my story, to talk to kids. And when I, when some of those kids who are now could be twenties or thirties, they know that they stand on the shoulders of those who came before them. Uh, and yeah. you're talking, I want to, I want to get, um, I want to get in that book that you talked about, Naked Civil Servant. Um, but just to yeah, know that this whole involvement process, whether I'm talking about being a school principal or being a gay man or being uh, married three times, um, that's just part of my story. And I don't, I, I'm to the point now, back to your, your question, not even to judge my own story. This is what my story is. Yeah. And uh, I want to share yes. my story. If people make um, comments, whether to me or in their heads silently or to other friends, that's their choice. Um, But I I feel very free and and a part of me in my own life that I had never felt before. Uh, I came to to the idea that I've got to be who I am. Uh, um, That is beautiful. What's that that Uh, song from? uh, yeah, that's a, I am who I am um, from. Yeah. Uh, it's going to come to me in a minute. Uh, I, but uh, I have lots of friends like that, uh, Kevin, that were married uh, men that were married and are gay. I have friends that are transsexual. I have all kinds of friends mm-hmm. um, that uh, um, that I love deeply. And uh, uh, as you know, as a young man, uh, we hung out. Um, yeah, uh, when I lived in Orlando, and uh, I I met some of the the best people in the world um, that learned and taught me how to love. So and mm-hmm. made me a better mm-hmm. man as a result. So uh, I I have nothing in my heart but absolute respect for the courage because it is a courageous life because of the society that we live in and the programming that um, the mainstream society. Uh, receives as a result and uh, back in the day when you were talking your day it would have been dangerous now it is even though it's dangerous today but it wasn't as dangerous as it was back then they could take you know alley and and take your life before you even know what and you know most of society would be like yeah it's all right you know Uh, but today they're the ch- the kids are a little more protected, but they're still those animals, if you wish, um, that are out there that are thinking that way. So, oh yeah, and I, um, I guess one of the dif- one of things... the different yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, say, say what's on your mind. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking that you know co- the comparisons of fifty years ago to today. What I try to convey, and with the with the community work I'm doing, still even uh, though I'm retired from the education profession, I still stay active um, to help youth or help people that were in my situation, married, <laughs> and wondering what to do. Mm-hmm. That there are support systems built in, and more yeah. and more support systems that are there that weren't available in the '60s, the '70s, the '80s. Uh, there's uh, not only support systems and groups and books and literature, um, more stories that people uh, have been uh, excited to tell, like like myself. But mm-hmm. it's these stories that people that we've been able to um, evolve. That even though you know that I live in the state of Florida, uh, which uh, things are very difficult in Florida right now. But I like to yeah. think that. Uh, there are um, places for people to go, places for people to talk to. Um, the The Pride Festival that we had just on Saturday had some of the best attendance it's had in years. So, I mean, there's still that expression and still people that are willing um, to be there to support each other. And I think that's a gift that I didn't have um in 1960 1970 1980 maybe even 1990 2000 i didn't have that 
and, and it's still uh but it, I, those those people have stepped up to use the baseball term stepped up to the plate and are being able to speak more and to be that resource for people it's pretty powerful yeah so I want you now to circle back because um you your life has been a beautiful journey and uh coming to the point where you are. I want you to circle back and talk about that book of yours two floors above mm -hmm. grief because it's right back to the beginnings if you will um yeah 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 where this young man was there on the floor you were talking about the relationship that you had uh with your family and the dichotomy of grief on the second floor and um this young man in some really powerful energetic um, yin and yang experience as far as death and life. Talk to us, um, Kevin, about um, two floors above grief. Uh, uh, bring us into the pages a little, uh, because uh, sure. and, and those that are listening to us, um, I'm going to provide all of Kevin's stuff. You know, I want you guys to that are in the space of grief and uh, uh, learning about those young. Uh, beautiful, courageous folks that we are in the, the gay and the lesbian community. Um, and you're hearing this uh, story. Purchase your books. Those the family members that you know, your nephew, your nieces, your brothers, your sisters are struggling. Get them this book so you can help them out and usher them and guide them that they're not alone that there's someone mm -hmm. here and they, um, I'll put Kevin's information so you guys can have that as well. Um, tell us a little about that journey with the books, uh, Kevin, uh, um, how it came about and how did sure. you feel after you, you gave birth to it, if you will. Okay. Yeah. Another trauma giving birth. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the, the, uh, and I, I, the, the two floors above grief book, you know, I, I probably mentioned, I just touch upon coming out maybe little tiny pieces, uh, partly because the book pretty much only goes till about 1984 or 19, 1990. So that whole part of me that you and I had uh, the good fortune to be able to talk about happens after the stories that are in the book. But um, when I... Um, when I talk about two floors above grief, it's just talking about, um, it's based on <laughs> letters that were written uh, between my parents, my aunt and uncle and myself, mostly from the years 1968 to 73 when I was a college student. One of those years was in mm -hmm. Italy. And so these letters have been saved and I have, uh, either they were saved by my parents or my aunt and uncle and as each person passed, another box would be un unpacked and um ev ev and then eventually I ended up with about seven or eight hundred pages of letters and I had wow. these letters with me and I thought uh and I'd read them occasionally or I'd find them in a box or whatever and I thought what am I going to do with these letters so part of the book part of the book um a lot of the stories in the book are based on the communication that was going on in letter form so an undercurrent in the book, too, is just the treasure of letters and what um, mm -hmm. what family, even the back the backdrop of the book cover is 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 pieces of those letters that were saved. And um, so what I what I talk about in the book a little bit is. What does a family do with these letters? What do you how do you unpack your yeah. own family history? And so when I had these letters and I decided in my own approach and I'm starting to get to the point where I'm teaching others now how to, if they come encounter these letters, how do you organize them? How do you put them together? How do you make sense out of them? Even though there's so many individual stories in the letters, how do you connect them? So I, I, I talk yeah. a little bit about how I organize the letters. And then when I got them all organized, I thought, what? And when I say organized, what I did is I put them in sequence. And then I read yeah. them all again in sequence. And then I thought, what do I do now? Well, I'm going to find the themes and how the characters are revealed. 
And so the subtitle of the book is a memoir of two families in the unique place we called home. Because this mm-hmm. this home part was an old Victorian house that was built in the 1880s. And my, my uncle was able to purchase it in 1938 uh, at an crazy price because it had been falling into disrepair because of the depression and things. So he had a, his business was growing. He had a vision of what he could do with his old house and um, Mm -hmm. made it into a funeral home on the first floor with two apartments above. So two floors above grief and the stories about the two floors above grief have to do with how our two families interacted. Um, Even before I was born in the 1940s, they they were dealing with the Second World War, not only f- with the families of people whose sons and daughters were coming back deceased from the war, but also the concept of ration stamps and how they had to do their own. Uh, my two families had to live with what was what was happening during the Second World War. And and the the, the way the house was constructed was in order for me to get to my apartment on the third floor, which used to be a a ballroom with two stages. um, Mm -hmm. In order to get to that, I had to walk through my aunt and uncle's apartment. So walking through their apartment, being walking around their kitchen, their dining room, I would see my three cousins who were older than me, um, but I would have these encounters. And so we were one big happy, and we were a happy family. yeah. My cousins and my brothers and sisters, my brothers, we treated each other as siblings and um, brothers and sisters. So and my aunt and uncle were like second parents to me, uh, which didn't downplay or t- take away from the parental relationship I had. But it was just all mm-hmm. how how these two families lived in this these spaces uh, together. And the the stories that I tell in the book um, are just just talk, unpack and talk about uh, things that most families go through. So the relatability factor, when I first wrote the book and started to conceive of writing the book, I thought, well, this is my main audience is my, the, the offspring that comes from these families, which now is up in the hundreds of grandchildren, great grandchildren. I wanted to give them a sense of what life was like uh, with their ancestors me being one of the ancestors, I guess now, but anyway, uh, but then as I was reading, working with editors and, and writing groups and they, they were telling me that, Hey, your stories here are, are not just for your family. They're for other, many other families. There's okay. You, your family grew up in a funeral home. Other families grew up above their dad's attorney's office or their, uh, I mean, the pediatrician I went to in Elgin, um, his family who lived upstairs from his office. So it, there's a mm-hmm. lots of families that uh, and kids that grew up as part of whatever their parents were doing. Oftentimes their environments were incorporated. So as I work as I worked with these uh, other advisors, friends, consultants, they said, "Hey, let's tell your story as if um, the impact it would have on other families as well." So that's the story. The book, writing the book evolved not only for from a personal standpoint to, to inform my own family, but to share stories with others. And that's as I, as the book's been published, published now for seven months. Um, and the feedback I'm getting from um, reviews and book clubs that I go to or presentations I make, people are making connections that, that I didn't even conceive of when I was writing the book. And that's been the thrill of, wow. of the book for me is 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 the reaction and um having people come to me not only about funeral home what was i like to be a funeral home kid but also coming back to me to say hey my family was very similar to yours or my family um my family conveyed some of some similar stories to me or i have a i have a chapter in there about miscarriages because my um mom had five miscarriages between the birth of my brother in 1940 and the birth of me in 1950. And so I have a dialogue in there, oh. which really happened between my father and me about what, tell me about this stuff called miscarriages and the way I unpacked yeah. it uh, with the way he unpacked it for me as a 10 year old. So, um, and people have come to me and say, Hey, that chapter 
that happened in my family too. And um, I, they appreciate the way my father had the capability to explain to a 10 year old at the time what it was all about. Yeah. So that, that they've, they've gained from that. Um, the other, uh, the other thing about is I, I, I just put stories in there about as families, we had to confront um, viruses and diseases that families don't have to do. I talk about polio. I talk about measles. I talk about um, how our family dealt with that, about the, the, the deal at that time was if, if we knew one of the kids in my class had measles, my mom would say, go to their house, <laughs> Be, hang in there with them. We want to, you know, so you can get exposed too. So we get through that part, uh, do the same thing. <laughs> we did the same thing with the mumps. We did the same thing. I mean, things that you, uh, and as I compare that to COVID now uh, and thinking, yeah. um, we looked for ways to not put ourselves into situations to pick yeah. up COVID in the fifties and sixties, the idea, and not that we, for those common diseases, the, the the child diseases, we my parents looked for ways to expose us to it. Now with polio, it was different. Yeah. We didn't you didn't want your kids to have polio, so the idea that we would that they would help out with any kind of fundraising to to help find a vaccine and how they found the vaccine and how we would line up to get get the shot, um, it, just a different yeah. concept than than. And I wanted to teach the readers about that because a younger reader isn't going to, they get their shots in the, within the first six weeks of their born and they never have to, most people don't have to think about measles and mumps and things like that or polio. Yeah, yeah. Whereas it was always, it was preying, uh, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, it was preying on the thoughts of, of my parents. And so the book, yeah. I wanted to show that and I wanted to tell the younger generation, but also when I get feedback from people, they're, they're talking about you know, how they get through their grief they, because I have a chapter on harmonizing and, and socializing and and um, parties and and people said this is how we got through our grief as well. So the the book was never it was not intended to be a way to help people um, get through their grief. <laughs> Although I have found out in from readers that that's helped them to know how, how our how my family and my aunt and uncle's family. How, how they, uh, how we dealt with grief. It's helping them in their grief process. So, and, the, and the, without giving, and I just talk about, I get, I enjoyed putting humor in the book. I enjoyed putting, and some of the letters that were uh, written conveyed humor um, about being an undertaker's wife or, or uh, what they, what my aunt and my mom did as the female part of the family what yeah. did they do to support the business how did they deal with the business the other part that i've got again getting into is um what when i talk bring the book to the undertaking profession the funeral home profession the subject of how does a funeral director deal with grief and in the book i talk about uh what my father did uh music what my mm -hmm. uncle did he just left the house for two or three days at a time he just left because that wow. was his, as I look back at his, 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 his exits, I think that was the way that he had to just get away from the environment for a while because dealing with other families, grief took a toll. So, um, yeah, well, I could sure. go on and on. And, and, and part of what the book ends in is this, my own son bought a house recently in the last two years, um, a Victorian house which is like a mini version of the house that I grew up in. So built the mm -hmm. same year, 1886. And um, when I was helping him move in and break through a wall or two, I, the idea that, hey, what I'm doing with my son is what my father and my uncle did to convert that old house into a funeral home. They had to tear through plaster and lath walls. They had to move things around and the same thing. I'm So the continuity of family, the continuity of traditions, the continuity of life uh, has certainly had a play in, in producing the book, uh, writing the book. And now I'm in the marketing stage of the book and that has presented its own set of joys and failures yeah. and frustrations and challenges, yeah. <laughs> but adapting myself to saying, hey, 
I love this process. I, I love what I'm doing. And uh, the same way I treated my education career, um, just to, to, to have that part of my life and, and enjoying this, these just, now that I'm a septuagenarian, uh, what do I deal with the seventies? Well, I start, what do I do? I start a new career. <laughs> I start a writing career yeah, and a marketing career. <laughs> so that, that that's been awesome. part of, of the joy of the book. So anyway. Probably you got oh, more man. in that answer than you were looking for. I don't know. <laughs> no, that is perfect. Perfect. Uh, Kevin, I want to thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. And we will try to do our best to help uh, promote you also here. So we are promote you in our local, uh, uh, all the uh, channels that we have, the podcasts, um, and uh, so that the people out there can buy your book. And it seems to have a series of wisdoms uh, from family that will be able to assist you. And again, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Well, I appreciate it, Ken, too. This has been, boy, an hour, more than an hour and a half. Uh, time went fast <laughs> and uh, it was like a, uh, you're, you're, the way you prompt yourself and the way you um, it's been a very, very rich dialogue, and I, I appreciate uh, you've gotten, you've helped provide ideas for my next book. I think too. So it, it's been, it's been a joy, it's been a joy talking to you and being able for to uh, to to listen to you and then be able to just have the freedom to respond and 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 draw draw out to to your prompts. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thanks.